Welcome to the 359. I'm Roger Chang. I'm Joni Salzman. Apple may have hit a legal snag in China. Qualcomm said this morning that a Chinese court has ordered a ban on iPhones in the country. Apple says it rem- iPhones remain available in the country and called this a desperate move by a company whose illegal practices are under investigation by regulators around the world. Lots of sniping between the two. Clearly, no love loss here. <laughs> um, keep in mind, like they're, they are stuck in this massive legal battle right now where... Apple has refused to pay Qualcomm for uh, a certain intellectual property related to the modems that uh, Apple used to use. Um, now they no longer use them. But this is uh, it's sort of the latest in this ongoing drama between these two tech titans. Right. Yeah. Uh, China's important to Apple, but yeah. it's not like it's important, but it's not the it's not their biggest market. It's not, but it increasingly. I think it will be down is the it, line. Is it the way that works out? It's like it's not the biggest market, but it's the most growth that they're seeing? Th- yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the sheer size and the brand appeal of Apple. I mean, it's like one of the rare U.S. companies that really has been successful out there. Yeah. Um, so it would be a blow if they lost the the right. Um, that said, I, you know, I've covered a lot of these these bans on uh, these product bans. And usually what happens is the other company goes in and files an appeal, suspends the order, and then they kind of right. work it out in the courts. So. Right. I guess that's what that's what will happen. Um, yeah, it's a little weird because Qualcomm came out really aggressively this morning, like no phones will be sold here, and then Apple said, "Wait a minute, that's not necessarily the case." Right. Uh, so we'll see how this all shakes out. Uh, speaking of Qualcomm, Shard Tipkin and Jessica Dolcord uh, are out with this story, wrapping up last week's Snapdragon Tech Summit. Uh, bottom line: the sheer amount of five G news, and there was a lot uh, <laughs> coming out last week, was an attempt to. Uh, destabilize or erode Apple's position in the wireless world, basically implying that if it's late to 5G, you know it's going to be behind everyone else. <laughs> and Qualcomm is first 5G, so they're they're in, in a great position. Uh, it feels like they're kind of you know sticking that knife in and twisting it a bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of um, uh, there were a lot of references to this other company that they would not name during the event, um, and and it was just kind of comical to see how they would. It's like individual one. It's yeah. like company A. Yeah, yeah. The, the kind of shade they were throwing um, on even minor things. I was just telling you earlier, like the 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 embrace of a new uh, photo format that Apple's been uh, embracing. Like Apple had to say, well, it's it's not just this one little feature that this other company talks about. It's about all these other things. So it's if you're in the know, you're clearly you know hearing all the shade being thrown. At so Apple. do you think that it actually matters that Apple, that Qualcomm and its phones will have 5G um, support before Apple? Do you think it really matters? Uh, not next year. I think if they're a year late, I don't think it's the end of the world. Um, I mean, clearly Apple's facing its own challenges with uh, with iPhone sales potentially in decline. Um, but uh, I think most people are going to stick to they're going to stick to the iOS that they're used to. And so five for a lot of people, 5G is not going to make that. Difference. Yeah. All right. Lastly, check out uh, Katie Collins' year review piece on how the EU has made its authority known to Silicon Valley companies. From GDPR to massive fines on Google, the EU hasn't been afraid to wallop companies like Facebook and Google. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been kind of a tough year for uh, the biggies. One of the, the things, uh, so I was at a conference last week, and one of the things that somebody brought up there that I thought was interesting was that in a way, it makes sense that Europe's go, like hitting so hard at these companies. Europe isn't like there's no Mark Zuckerberg wings of hospitals in Europe. Yes, you know there's no like there's they get all of the downsides of like the Facebooks and the Googles um, and all these other big tech titans, but they don't get a lot of the upsides either. It's true. They're not. I guess Zuckerberg's not donating to right. Paris. I right. Um, yeah, and that's where, I mean, I think that's why the U.S. is definitely, that's a really good reason why it's dragged its feet on privacy regulations, on really holding these guys to their, you know, to the fire. Uh, speaking of Google, Senator Pichai will be testifying before Congress tomorrow. For our full coverage on that, check us out on CNET. I'm Roger Chang. I'm Joni Salzman. Thanks for listening. So in regards to Sundar Pichai's um, Judiciary Commission uh, testif- testif- testification? Testimony. What's- Testimony, thank you. Testify. This is why I'm pushing the buttons and not talking. Uh, <laughs> that is actually going to push our show back tomorrow, so now is a good time to mention that we'll be going late tomorrow, and it's going to be completely contingent 
on when that wraps up. So we'll actually be streaming the entire hearing on CNET on YouTube and live stream and Periscope and maybe Twitch. I'm not even sure at this point. Um, so if you want to see how bad Pachai gets grilled, this is the place. Uh, if you're looking for the 359, just stay tuned. We'll try to keep you updated on Twitter as far as when we're going to be able to pick up, but it's going to have to be post the hearing because I can't do two shows at once. And uh, yeah, that'll be the official like post-show kind of recap about what goes down. So if you want the abbreviated version, just come back and find us later in the afternoon. Uh, before we jump into the questions, I have a bit of trivia again. I love digging these little little nuggets up. Uh, today, December 10th, would have been Ada Lovelace's birthday. The Countess of Lovelace, the English mathematician and writer, chiefly known for her work on Charles Babbage's proposed mechanical general purpose computer, the analytical engine. I thought that was a neat little tidbit to include today. Way to go. <laughs> yeah. Yay, I did homework. Uh, all right, so us. might as well go ahead and jump right into the chat and start pulling questions. Uh, from TigerX966, uh, this is a comment more than a question. They need to settle so Apple can get APT XHD and low latency codecs for better Bluetooth audio. And I think we're all on board with that since we're never going to see the headphone jack come back. <laughs> yeah, the, that's true. I mean, I, when I was down in San Diego, they showed me sort of the difference between the audio codecs that Qualcomm uses versus sort of standard Bluetooth. And it does make a pretty big difference. Um, I don't know. I feel like the ship is kind of sailed for Apple and Qualcomm um, using equipment, using each other's equipment for a little while. This lawsuit could drag on for a long time, and it's getting. I feel like it's getting increasingly bitter. Mm -hmm. It's like these these shots that are being taken here, uh, and it's the more these headlines come out, the less likely it is that they'll they'll settle. It doesn't seem like they're settling anytime soon. Speaking of settling, uh, Tiger X also wants to know, did Apple ever pay the man they stole the Animoji trademark from? Oof, lots of shade coming from Tiger X. Yeah. Where have I, you been? I don't know. That's, I, I didn't, I, I kind of didn't even realize that. Mm. Um, sorry, I don't think, I don't, I don't know if they did. <laughs> All right, so let's take a real one now. Uh, thanks again, Tiger X. You're making it interesting today. Uh, Timothy Du, will this ban affect the iPhone XS Max in China, which has two physical SIM slots? Assuming uh, it actually the ban takes effect at all, no, yeah, it well, could be an idle threat, yeah, right? Yeah, I, I, to the yeah to my earlier point, I think that the the ban is just going to be will likely be suspended until they kind of figure things out in court. But I believe it applies to all models of the ten. So right. ten, ten S Max, ten S, so, yeah. blah blah blah. Yeah, okay. I think it, I think it applies to all models of iPhone from like six through ten. Got it. Which is like all the ones that they actually sell. Right. Right. Yeah. It's a pretty broad sweeping threat, pretty ballsy move on their part, if I do say so well, myself. Well, they didn't make the threat. I think they were just publicizing the result of this case, right? Yes, exactly. So the, they the, didn't... The court yeah. ordered the ban, and right. Qualcomm was trumpeting it. Right. It was kind of dancing with glee. And it was a as fairly... Much as so the patents they used to accuse Apple of infringing upon their technology uh, are relatively new. One was to adjust and reformat the size and appearance of photographs, so it was fairly general. Uh, manage applications using a touchscreen when viewing, navigating and dismissing applications on their phone. Uh, those are the three patents. Um, it is a little weird that these patents are coming up right now. Uh, Apple made the point that these are relatively uh, new uh, complaints, um, considering that this stuff is all like kind of like default baked into smartphones now. So it's uh, it's a little unusual that they're just bringing up these patents. All commas patent troll. Yeah. So well. 2018. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, Qualcomm and their de developmental habits here. Uh, Tim also asks, I understand there's a need for hardware upgrade, but does Qualcomm need to grade their chip, Snapdragon 834, 835, 36, et cetera, every single year? Why don't they just focus on a generation chip instead of a yearly upgrade? I don't even know where to begin to answer I, that. I, I don't even question. know how to unpack that question. I'm not entirely <laughs> sure... Well, he's saying, why do they why do they focus every single year on like a car dealership rather than focusing on like a generation like an operating system? Oh, say, like, would. like having just like one chip for all phones or not necessarily. He's saying the upgrades still roll, but I don't know. Maybe it's just I'm picturing in my head instead of buying the 1997 Honda Civic and then the 1998 Honda Civic, buying the generation three Honda Civic and then 2001 rolled out and you get the generation four Honda Civic. Yeah, I, I, it makes more sense to, I guess, equate it to how operating systems kind of roll out. They're not every single year 
necessarily no, no, sometimes all, to the most systems part come out pretty much every year like microsoft chips them out twice a year sometimes uh, that's a good point i guess i'm really bad at creating these analogies i'm not really <laughs> sure where he's trying to go with that but i kind of yeah, like if you could clarify i mean i would just say that um if you're asking about why they don't just do like one chip for all phones like and have that be like a generation one chip versus a generation two chip um it is kind of to brian's car dealership analogy like there's like the Ferrari chip and then there's like the Honda Civic chip. And like if you're paying a hundred bucks for a phone, you're using the Honda Civic chip. If you're buying an iPhone or not an iPhone, sorry, a Galaxy S9, that's going to be the Ferrari chip. So um, there, I mean, there's different levels of chips for different prices. And that's, that's kind of why they, they break it out that way. But instead of that, why not something like a Windows XP, Windows Vista 7, 10? I guess it's really just coming down to nomenclature, isn't it? Like, well, it's, No, I it, think it's uh, being able to like uh, break out the different prices allows handset manufacturers to change the pricing on their devices or have a, a portfolio of both cheap and expensive phones. So if everyone's using the exact same chip, then there's less price differential. Okay, I think I understand what you're saying. Like you can't get all the super high end, like like... That would be fantastic if, like, the person paying a hundred bucks would get the same features as the person paying a thousand bucks for their smartphone. But that's just not how the world works. It'd be awesome no. if we could all have Teslas for free. Yeah, that works too. Economically, that probably doesn't work too well. But yeah, that's kind of the same logic. They're trying to like break out the pie, incentivize. Yeah, got it. Okay, here's one from P Improm Imp 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 Mom P Imp Mom. Got it. Uh, well, it's time for Apple to start building their phone in the States. Do we think that's even remotely possible? Because Ooh. it's an interesting thought. Um, no, <laughs> I don't think it's possible. Um, it's possible on a limited scale, but you have to keep in mind, like, Apple sells how many phones per quarter? Like 50, 60 million? Find out. Let's find out. Um, I'll, I'll get right on It's that. a lot, though, right? So um, that, that, that kind of uh, volume requires a lot of things, it requires massive facilities, it requires a lot of investment, um, and it requires a lot of labor, and fairly skilled labor. Um, and in China, there, I mean, there actually is a, a pretty large supply of decently skilled labor there. That's less the case in the U.S., where um, it's harder to find. Motorola tried this a few years back with um, one of their Moto phones, I, I can't remember which one, but the, it was, you know, they built, they made a big deal about making a factory, building a factory in the U.S., having these phones built here. They scrapped that plan after a couple of years because it just became too cost prohibitive. Like, it's just, it's too expensive. It's a shame because it would have been oh. potentially wonderful. How, so how many iPhones are sold? So in quarter, in Q1 for Apple, which is usually their heaviest quarter, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yep. Q1 for Apple in the most recent, they just finished their last year and Q1 of that year. They sold 77 million iPhones. In a quarter. In a quarter. Wow. And then the most recent quarter, um, not their biggest quarter, um, they sold almost 47 million. Yeah. So like that sheer amount of volume, like it just, at least right now, it can't be done. I mean, you could, I think if you had like a long-term plan, uh, like a 10-year plan in terms of building out the infrastructure for it, but Apple can do it. Apple, and, and the other issue is, uh, given sort of the higher labor costs here in the U.S., higher just higher costs in general. Like I kind of did sort of the back of the envelope math on that. Like your iPhone would be at least twice as much, if not more, if it was built in the U.S. Bummer. Yeah. Uh, rolling back to that thought process of the development in uh, Qualcomm, uh, Alan Max Diaz uh, points this out. Logic would be if development of the hardware and the software was unified. It should have lower cost because it is its own. It's self-contained. It's uh, the outsourcing by payment of royalties that should be more expensive. I mean, that's a pie-in-the-sky dream, is it not? Yeah, yeah. I mean, part of the issue with Apple's, they do have their sort of own end-to-end -end system, right? They control the yeah. hardware and software. And they don't actually, they don't use Qualcomm's processor. They just take the modem, the antenna, and it's just one component. It's not like Android phones where they take the Qualcomm Snapdragon processor and like all the the intellectual property that goes along with it, all the features like fast charging. Uh, Apple doesn't take as much, and so they argue that all the money that they're paying Qualcomm for for innovations they've developed themselves, um, and so they feel like it's not justified to pay that that high premium. Gotcha. I'm not taking a side on that. I mean, it's up to the courts really to decide, you know, what uh, how much Apple should pay, but that's sort of the the crux of the the dispute. 
Here's another one from Tim. Will there be new tech like a new version of Bluetooth? Infrared light on the remote controllers is still going strong. Just new tech in general? Well, new Bluetooth, I think. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, Bluetooth's constantly advancing. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert at Bluetooth, um, but I, I know there are revisions and new versions that come out at, once a year at least. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, what do we think about AMD getting into the mobile cellular modern industry? I feel like we were asked this last week, too. I don't think they have any mobile ambitions, as far as I can tell. Uh, they make processors for servers and desktops and laptops. Uh, and from what I understand, their chips are, are way more aggressive, more competitive now. They're, they're actually a lot more uh, powerful than the Intel ones, but... I'm not sure if they're in phones or if they even want to be in phones. It's a, it's a tough market. I guess let's uh, switch gears over to uh, the European Union topics at hand. Uh, what is some of the fallout we think we're going to see in 2019 now that so much has unfolded this year, last year and a half-ish following Cambridge Analytica and everything else? Right. Um, what, what are some of the actions that we're going to see? What are some of the repercussions uh, with with all the, the major players, like you said, Facebook, Google, the big boys? Well, I think that Article 13 of the Copyright Directive is the next, um, like GDPR, and not so much Cambridge Analytica because that was a scandal that's sort of centered in Europe rather than policy that's centered in Europe. Got it. But that's the next kind of wave where, um, where legislation centered in Europe but has global effect mm -hmm. is going to sort of stem from. And so that should start happening b before, we might start seeing uh, implications of that before the end of this year and definitely into 2019, depending on if it gets enshrined in law. And just to not. refresh, like what, like what is Article 13 actually? So Article do? 13, it's the idea that um, both in America, in the US and in Europe, there have, since the dawn of the consumer internet, been safe harbor provisions against copyright, which means that any tech company isn't held responsible, liable, for copyrighted content that's uploaded onto their service, that they don't have to be responsible for what every single one of their users uploads. Um, and so people argue that you know when Facebook and Google and uh, other companies like that are the most powerful companies in the world, they don't ne necessarily need that sort of safe harbor provision anymore. It was designed at a time when the internet needed to protect these companies so they could become more powerful. Um, but then on the other side, people say that the way that this legislation has been written, it's too vague and mm. that no, even Google, um, which already has a system in place to sort of kind of deliver on the things that it's asking them to do, they still don't do it well enough that like the idea is that there'd be a lot of content that would be de facto, de facto censored, um, whether rightly or wrongly, depending on how well they're able to filter copy. They've come for our memes, is what you're saying. That's what a lot of people are putting it as. Like, people like to talk about memes because everybody loves memes. And it's true in a way. But, like, it has implications for video and for music and blah, 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 blah. Anything that's a copyrighted thing. Um, I'd be interested to see any proposals that they, they put forth as far as how to automate and regulate that process because you know that's going to be their first goal is to try to take the human interest out of it. Because that makes the most amount of sense, and how that's going to backfire on digital content creators, I I, I, I put money on it that they'd implement a system where we could get flagged for repurposing our own content. Mark my words. Are you talking about legislators? Or are you talking about companies? Uh, let's go with companies for now. I think he's talking about those company like systems. If you like put into like their algorithms, like yeah. Like, they'll misread certain content. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Well, that's, yeah, a big concern. Is that not that they would do it on purpose. It's just that, like, even the most powerful, like, Google has content ID on YouTube. And even that gets things wrong all the time. And it's yeah. the most advanced sort of system. All the time. Yeah. Um, it's the most advanced sort of system like that on the planet for one of the biggest media resources on the planet. So, um, yeah, that's part of the problem. You can argue that, like, Google um, and YouTube weren't incentivized to actually make something that worked well to this degree before. And maybe that's mm. why it works so badly. Maybe that's why, but maybe, maybe it's true that like, you know, the cart got before the horse and YouTube created a platform without the repercussion, like thinking of the repercussions on people that are copyright holders rather than people that want to um, take advantage of copyrighted works. 
And you said by 2019, is that kind of the best estimate we can come up with for a timeline for this? To kind yeah, of... I think like it sort of depends. I don't know exactly, but I think that I know, I know that it could be, it's a matter of they're teasing out final wording right now before it's already been like approved and passed in a way that in, in a kind of language that Google, um, Reddit, uh, other companies have spoken out against. Um, and now they're tweaking the final wording before it becomes actual law. And I think that's supposed, that could happen as early, like before the, like in the next couple of weeks. Wow. Oh, wow. That's insane how quickly yeah. that, that came to be. Um, how exactly was Article 13 enforced before the rise of well, social media? Well, it didn't media? exist before. Right. Like it's part of a new, le it's part of new legislation um, that was passed, I think, in. Like over the summer, right? Over the summer. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of those, it's, it's a progressive process, but like people have been, yeah, talking about it since the summer mostly. Um, yeah. And like I said before, Article 13, this new legislation, um, before that, there in in Europe and in the U.S., there were these these um, there was this policy around the safe harbor idea, um, and so now we're seeing the first challenge, um, rethinking of whether or not safe harbor is a good idea or not. Well, safe harbor was always kind of a gray area to put it as lightly as possible. So, I'm I'm kind of interested. I know we have other content creators in our fan base, um, so everyone's experience is going to be different in this. If you experience some kind of effect that's related to article 13 i'd love to hear what's happening either post it in the comments or tweet at us um just to see what varying degrees of effect this is going to have and how accurate it actually plays out uh before we go let's switch gears back one more time to uh qualcomm apple uh the apple ban in china would that involve e-commerce sales like ebay as well Ooh, um i guess if it held up theoretically um, if you were buying China, I think so. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> any again, any third party really. Yeah. Again, I don't. Um, I don't think the ban will hold up. Um, and you think this is just a scare tactic? It's not a scare tactic. I mean, it's just part of the legal process that these bans get put in place and then they get challenged and then they put on they get put on hold until they kind of work out the details in court. Got it. And I don't think that it would apply to third-party resellers yeah, necessarily, because this is something against Apple's own their own subsidiaries, exactly in China. their own businesses in China. Um, I think the idea is that, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess third-party retailers would be, could, would be able to buy them and then resell them. I guess so. Theoretically, I don't know. Boom market for for the under the table resellers. Alibaba, and... I guess. I'm trying to think. It's not. It wouldn't be eBay. It would be like you'd get it from Alibaba or some other third-party retailer. One more before we wrap it up. I like this. It came in at the 11th hour here from Nadim, but it's interesting. Will Article 13 uh, form the basis of new business models like charging a subscription fee for copyrighted content? I could see large YouTubers paying for that. Yeah, hmm. the idea being like you pay for a collection of stuff that you know has all like all the I's dotted and T's crossed hmm. on copyright and that way you know you're safe. Um, I think those already exist. It's just that um, the internet's such a kind of like creative free for all. Um, it would, you know, the people that would be affected in that sense would be just like normal people who want to like do a cover of a song that they love mm. and post it on, on YouTube. Like those are people, people that are YouTubers and have a business out of it, have people and themselves, they already think about copyright, but it's, you know, like just normal users of yeah. the internet who want to post a meme that draws from like Rick and Morty or um, want to do a cover of uh, uh, a song that they love. That's the people that wouldn't have the expertise to know yeah. that what they're doing could be getting them in, well, could be getting them in copyright trouble, but also second degree under Article 13, getting that company in trouble that they're posting it to. Do you think uh, the platform saw this as writing on the wall and that's why we see a lot more things like a YouTube Premium, YouTube Red, no, those I kind of subscriptions coming out or is this no, more reactionary? I think they're definitely not related at okay. all. Um, Just money. Yeah. yeah. Just everybody likes money. <laughs> all right. We're out of time. Thanks, everybody, for joining us again. We only got three episodes left in 2018. So, wow. uh, you know, make sure to yeah. set your calendar dates, except for tomorrow, of course, because we don't know when we're going to be live tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned. Thanks, everyone. All right. 359 is available on iTunes, TuneIn, FeedBurner, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Google Podcasts, the Amazon Echo, and, of course, CNET.com. We'll see you all tomorrow at some point. We don't Sometime. know when. Sometime. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.